is Keys to the Shop, episode 299, Top 5 Rules for a Successful Coffee Shop. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional, whether you are a manager, an owner, a trainer, somebody who's just trying to be a better leader and build a good career in coffee uh, and a better business, this show is for you. And welcome to all of you who have just discovered Keys to the Shop. I would encourage you to subscribe to the show. We come out with a lot of episodes per month, and um, they're all geared towards giving you those resources that you need. And I hate to have you miss any. So definitely hit subscribe. And if you find yourself thinking that this stuff is just really good and Maybe you think of somebody who you would like to share the episode with. I would really uh, think that's a good idea. <laughs> you should share these episodes with a friend, and uh, that'll spread the love and uh, spread the message of Keys to the Shop. So thanks very much for doing that. Now, Keys to the Shop, on top of doing this podcast, also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. If you want to do over-the-phone consultation to help you level up your operations, or to help you walk through the setting up of your very first coffee business. Keys to the Shop Consulting can definitely help you either remotely or over the phone, like I said, or on site with barista trainings, cafe assessments, and we're all about helping your operations, quality, and people get to the next level and helping you build foundations for a sustainable and joy-filled coffee business experience. So if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, I'd love to talk with you. All you need to do is email me, chris at keys to the shop.com, and we can set up a free discovery call and see what working with keys to the shop consulting looks like for you and your business. Again, the email for keys to the shop consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now today's episode is brought to you by the amazing Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee specializes not just in providing world-class commercial coffee equipment, but their focus is on helping you select the right equipment for your business. Whether you need brewers, grinders, espresso machines, or under-counter refrigeration, it's small wares. I mean, Prima Coffee has an incredible selection and is an awesome resource to help you get outfitted and supplied with the best. Now, Keys to the Shop listeners can get 5% off their entire order by using the code KEYS5 at checkout. So visit prima-coffee.com slash keys and explore what they have to offer. And definitely don't forget to use that code KEYS5, that's K-E-Y-S and the number 5, for 5% off your entire order. Again, if you're in the market for commercial coffee equipment and want to work with amazing people who are dedicated to your success, then you need to work with prima coffee dot com slash keys. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series from Pacific. Uh, the Barista Series is the standard setter for excellence in plant-based performance beverages worldwide. I mean, these beverages are designed for and tested by the world's best baristas. So no matter what you use from their complete lineup of plant-based beverages, you can expect it to stand up to the heat from the steaming process, have awesome texture and balance in the cup, So your coffee is always the star of the drink. Uh, Check them out over at pacificfoodservice.com and get it in your shop. Try it out. I believe you and your customers are going to be quite impressed. So if you want to serve world-class plant-based beverages in your cafe, then you need to be using the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, well, today we are talking about the five rules for success in a coffee shop. I say top five rules. Um... And, and of course, that's subjective. Um, these are things that I think are high priority items. And um, the thing about running a coffee shop, let's just get this out of the way. There are basics out there. There's a lot of books that actually tell you how to run a coffee shop. Um, there are a lot of things that we know about, you know, finding a great location with heavy footfall or a lot of traffic with car traffic. Um, we know about hiring smart and marketing, and we know about you know, writing a great business plan. And there there are things that just make sense for a retail store. And those are the very basics, right? But in my experience, I think there are a lot of other things that are kind of the invisible glue that hold a business together. And also they hold the people in the business together, if you know what I mean. So you don't 
lose it <laughs> in business and you are sustained and the business is sustainable. And that really is a lot of the motivation for how I interview people for, you know, what keys to the shop is all about. It's not so much that there's uh, one basic thing that's going to mean success for you. It's the nuance. It's the application. It's the intuition that you develop over time. Again, those invisible things that glue everything together and hold a business up. Um, under stress, that's really important. And so today I wanted to kind of go over what I believe are some really key things that your business needs in order to be successful. So let's get into the first thing here. Number one, in order to have a successful coffee shop, you have to continually cultivate passion balanced with realism. So let's dig into that just a little bit here. Continual cultivation of passion is incredibly important because you can't rely on your initial passion to continue past the challenges that you're going to face within the first day, week, month. There's going to be unheard of challenges. For any of you who opened your business during COVID, you know this is true. The initial passion that you have to open your business is not enough to sustain you for the duration of your business. Passion is something that I think you need to uh, cultivate in seasons. So you might have enough drive and momentum with the dream that you have to push through the business plan, the build out, the hiring, the grand opening. And at the end of all that, it feels kind of, sometimes it feels like a letdown. Sometimes it depends on who you are as a person, but a, a lot of times it, it just feels like it's opening up to this crescendo and then it's business. And then there are these different challenges that are somewhat unexpected. Sometimes they're expected, but they didn't come in the way that you thought they were going to come. And where you were very energized before, now you're feeling like it's not so much there. So now the work of cultivating passion has to start. You have to renew your why. And that's not to say that you have to change your why, but you have to contextualize it. You can't say, well, you know, I got to get back to that original place where I was because now you're not there anymore. You have new responsibilities. You have new pressures and, and deadlines and people counting on you. And you need to be able to find a place for that original why in the present day and continually tend to it so that it doesn't just fall off. It's easy to assume that, you know, that dream and that goal in the beginning is going to carry through past these challenges, but often that just isn't the case. And it's all about being intentional in connecting your vision, your values, and your why to what is happening right now. So it's continually before your eyes and it's motivating you no matter what situation you find yourself in. And it's a grounding force and it's a sustaining force. That's part of what it means to have a sustainable business. Now, the second part of this uh, tip, which is you have to balance it with realism. It's easy to take your vision and say, I'm so motivated and I am cultivating my passion right now and I am going to, you know, I'm going to manifest this vision right here, right now, and I'm just going to make it happen. And sometimes that's done to the detriment of everything else around you. You weren't paying attention to, for instance, the numbers. Like you wanted to have a, a I don't know, like a, a tiki type of drink on your menu because it was so something that you wanted. And it was, you're very passionate about that. And nobody's buying it, but you're just like, no, this is my vision. I'm going to do it. And you just push and push, but you're not being realistic. You're not looking at what's actually happening. You're not letting the numbers help balance your passion and your vision. There is kind of an overlap between the two. You have to have a successful business, which means you're going to have to make some compromises, which I know is a dirty word. None of us compromise, right? Um, but you really do have to have a profitable business in order to fulfill even part of your vision. And I'll tell you, uh, especially if you're just getting started in a, the coffee business. I don't know anybody who has started a coffee bar who has fulfilled 100% of what they set out to do 
at least not within the first few years, if not after 10 years. There are people that are still working on trying to get over 50% of what they thought they were going to be doing with their coffee businesses because you never know what the reality will be until you put this thing in the water. And that is why you need to be continually cultivating a sense of realism along with a sense of passion. So you're touching base with both of those things all the time, letting one really motivate you and the other one keep you in check and make sure that you're not just losing money to try to fulfill a dream that ends up turning this whole thing into a nightmare, right? So that's number one, continual cultivation of both passion and a sense of realism, okay? Now, number two is to pursue humility, empathy, and feedback. So if you're not new to Keys to the Shop, as I've heard James Hoffman use this phrase before, this is kind of a forehead slappingly obvious thing. And of course I would say this, but nonetheless, let's focus in on how to pursue humility, empathy, and feedback. And the key word here is pursue. Let's think about that for a second. Why would you have to pursue something? Well, the obvious answer is because it's not there right now. It's somewhere else. And also, pursuing something kind of shows you that it's on the move. It's elusive. It kind of has a mind of its own. Humility is something that's kind of a moving target, partially because it's being displaced and pushed away constantly by us and our pride. Uh, empathy is the same way. Our selfishness wants to focus on just us, uh, and that's a survival instinct. Feedback wants to close down any possibility that we're going to hear something that we don't like. And so we are kind of pushing these things away, and that's why we have to kind of pursue them. And so as these things kind of naturally will move away from us, we do have to pursue them to kind of counterbalance the way that we are naturally. So in the pursuit of humility, what we need to do is constantly be sort of putting the you are here sign on ourselves. It's like one of those YouTube videos I've, I've seen where they take the earth and then they say, um, you know, here we are in the solar system, here we are in the galaxy and the universe. And it gives you the impression that some of the shallow arguments that you're having with your, your spouse or your friends may not be as big as you thought because the earth itself is not even as big as you thought. Humility is about putting yourself in perspective within the greater context of what you are responsible for. And when you're running a coffee business, whether you're the owner or not, you are responsible for something that's unfathomably impactful. The ripple effect of your business cannot be calculated. So many people are going to be impacted by it. And when you think about that, think that you are just one person amongst many who are contributing to that impact. It's not all you. It's a group effort. Again, I've said it a thousand times. It's kind of a co-created entity. And so we have to pursue humility because we know that we're likely to have a big head we're likely to cling to power instead of using our power for others. We just cling to it and hoard it for ourselves. Pursuing humility is the first step to having a successful coffee bar because it empowers other people and it motivates other people to do the same thing. Once you have that internal compass set on pursuit of humility, now you can really start practically pursuing empathy, knowing what it's like to work the systems that you create. Uh, I tell this story of a client years and years back who uh, was scheduling people for clopins, the close and open shift. Now, if you close really early, you know, if you close at 4 p.m. and then you open at 8, a clopin's not really that bad. But still, you know, some places close much later and most do, and then they open early. It's not that great. And she only stopped because she ended up working a couple of them and said, this is terrible <laughs> and nobody should have to go through this. But it took actually physically, you know, feeling what it was like to do the work. We actually have to put a physical effort into doing the things that we want other people to do. Now, at a certain scale, you might not actually have as much time on your hand. Like if you have like 
five, seven shops, you know, at least you have to have your delegated authority being able to empathize through a physical effort of knowing what it's like to do the work. The reason why this is important is because, again, we're counterbalancing a natural default that we have to overload people because of a lack of impact it has on us. It's easy for things to be out of sight and out of mind. Not if we're doing it, though, and, and we're touching the work. Then, then it becomes something different. That's really key to a successful coffee bar is to constantly pursue empathy that way. So now let's move to feedback. So we've pursued humility, empathy, now feedback. Of course, we want to know how people are experiencing this stuff. It's one thing if we do it and we say this is cool, but now in the real world of doing the work where there's customers and you know it's, it's really a, a real situation that might be something completely different, the best way to pursue feedback is to put it in your mind that you are constantly touching base with people to hear what the, what is on their mind regarding the work and how they are doing as a human being within your business, that there is a trust built over time. You cannot expect this to happen right away. This takes time because trust takes time. But the system has to be there for you to have those one-on-ones, you have to have a history of taking action on the feedback that is given to you in order for people to not only continue to give feedback to you, but to even trust that you're going to do anything about it. And so the last thing I'll say about feedback here is that you have to be able to accept it, even if it's something negative and it's something directed at yourself. Because after all, if you've developed a certain degree of trust with people and they feel safe to communicate with you, at a certain point, that safety that they feel is going to allow them to tell you something that's vulnerable and rubs you the wrong way. I mean, why do you think that people that are close oftentimes hurt each other the most? It's because they don't have any walls. Now, this is a professional environment. And I'm not advocating that we uh, blur these things. Quite the opposite. I'm a strong advocate for being professional and drawing professional lines. But a consequence of people feeling like they have a certain safety and feedback means that you might get your feelings hurt, whether it's directed to, at you as a person or uh, at the business in general. You can't all of a sudden resurrect your ego as a way of being defensive because that's not pursuing feedback, that's pushing it away. That's not even pursuing humility, it's pushing it away. So you have to be prepared for that. So let's move on to number three, which is to develop people first systems. We started this whole podcast, not this episode, but the podcast itself years ago, back in uh, 2017, with uh, one of the original episodes on how to be a people first leader. And that's kind of a magical phrase right there. If you just want to use the term people first and put it in front of anything, (laughs) you know, it really becomes uh, a different conversation altogether. But we're talking about systems. Systems are care and systems have to be designed for the benefit of the people using them and experiencing the end result of them. You, again, have two customer groups your employees and your customers. They're both customers of the business and you want good reviews from both of them. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to create systems and processes that are not only geared toward the success of the business, but also for the benefit of the people in the business, that they can accomplish what they need to accomplish at work, have a sense of pride, not any kind of undue stress. Of course, there's it's work, so of course there's going to be some stress at work. There's going to be some effort. <laughs> you know, we're not trying to make everything just super super easy. Um, we're not trying to eliminate work in this. But when we create people first systems, we are doing so to try to avoid creating unrealistic situations where people burn out managers that are overloaded with too many expectations from an owner, baristas that have too many things to do during the closing shift, a bar that's not set up correctly, a method of making drinks that's overly complex. There's too many steps and it's the best seller and nobody likes making it. People are the first thing that you need to consider when creating a system. So in order to do that, you need to fight to maintain connection to the cafe, the people, and the mission. 
your vision will be realized only through properly developed systems, right? And in order to do that, you need to have connection to the cafe and the people in order to know that what you're inventing is actually appropriate. A lot of the systems that uh, managers who are not connected to the cafe or an owner who just kind of randomly finds a system template online, you know, they'll put it into the cafe and it kind of goes over like a fart in church. You know, it's, it doesn't go over well. I guess it depends on the kind of church you go to. But um, <laughs> the point is, is that it's contextually wrong. It's not supposed to be there because it's not for that particular store or your business. So when you are connected to the cafe and the people, you're going to make decisions that have more context and are easier to accept when you are the barista working in that store because it shows whoever made this knows what I'm going through. They can empathize. Back to empathy. They can actually understand that. The whole goal of your business and coffee in general is that we are giving hospitality. Hospitality has to extend beyond what we give customers. We want them to experience our cafes and the tables and and everything else in an effortless way or in, in a way that makes them feel like they had a great experience. The same has to go for our staff and we need to build our shops so that people feel it was one of the best jobs they ever had. And in order for that to happen, we need people first systems. Okay, so now let's move on to number four. The fourth key for having a successful coffee shop is to celebrate community and staff. Celebrate them. So there are actions associated with all of these. You have to cultivate, you have to pursue, you have to develop, and now we're on to celebrate. The first thing that we have to do in order to celebrate community is by being genuine and by being dedicated to the community's success. Your cafe is part of this neighborhood, or even if it's not in a neighborhood, quote unquote, it's still part of the fabric of somebody's daily routine or a group of people's daily routine, whether that's in a downtown area, a suburban strip mall, or a hip new mixed use high rise building, or just a, a, a plain old neighborhood. No matter what, there are groups of people that see your coffee shop as a normal part of the fabric of their lives. And that is a community. And so how are you dedicated to the success of that community? Well, of course, we're going to start with the basics of running a, a good business. So we're always around a profitable business, good hospitality and quality and all of that fun stuff, right? But beyond that, we need to be able to be aware of what the community needs. That means we need to not shut our doors to what our neighborhood has going on and just do our own thing and look like the coffee bar that's all about trying to show people who we are but not care about who you are. We're just concerned with our own stuff. We really want you to care about our coffee, but we don't really want to care about you. You see, I don't think that we get a ton of negative feedback when we do that, and it causes us to think that it's okay to do that. It's okay to just kind of um, be, be an island, right? However, maybe people aren't going to leave bad Yelp reviews saying they're not as active in the community as I thought they would be. But you are leaving a lot of possibility on the table for the success of your cafe. In a lot of the places where I've worked, I've seen an incredible benefit to being plugged in, charitable, generous, and actively involved in the community and celebrating your place because people have a pride in their place. And if you're not going to celebrate that, they're going to celebrate it with or without you. And at a certain point, they're going to kind of notice by whether explicitly or just kind of not thinking of you um, that you don't. And so celebrating the community, I think, is a great way to level up the kind of success your coffee bar can have. Uh, pride in place, connection to what's going on in your neighborhoods and with the people around you, it really goes a long way. Not only that, but also celebrating your staff. So if we're talking about having generosity towards your customers and being plugged in that way, the same goes for your staff. Celebrating them as the face of the business because most of the time, it's not you. Unless we're talking about 
you know, you know, who are the founders and doing interviews on podcasts and things like that. Oftentimes you hear a lot from the owners um, when it comes to media, you, but the people that you see when you come into the coffee bar are the baristas. And owners and operators would do well to be aware of that and not just aware of it, to celebrate it, to give ample affirmation, recognition, and that mentality and that practice leads to more compensation. Also, I think if you've cultivated a thankfulness and an awareness of just how critical your staff are as the face of your business, it's more likely that you're going to make generous decisions uh, regarding the finances that are directed towards them, whatever that looks like for your shop. So that's number four here. Celebrate community and staff. And now finally, on our list of top five ways to run a successful coffee bar is to iterate and reinforce your concept. I said it earlier, I'll say it again, your business is going to change. It's gonna change in the best times and it's gonna change in the worst times. The fact that we had to pivot so much as an industry, that is the worst times, right? Now, it might lead to some different opportunities that we can be thankful for later down the line for some of you, right? But in the best times, cafes still and always will need to be able to pivot and iterate and and, and change as their business grows, as the people go in and out and the neighborhood changes or or you become uh, less available as you were to take on certain things in the business. There are tons of different factors that go into why you might have to change your business. You just need to listen to almost any Founder Friday episode on Keys to the Shop. Dorian Bolden of BU Cafe, Kathy Turiano of Joe Bean Coffee Roasters in Rochester. Uh, The list can go on. They had to change the way they did business based on the way the business signaled to them a need for change and also based on what they realized they could and could not do or even just wanted to do. And what we learned from our founders on Founder Friday, we've learned all of this stuff and more on their episodes um, because the story, while the nuances might be unique to a particular coffee shop, there's some really universal stuff here. The key is not to be in denial. And to really just face it and embrace necessary change. It's easy to be in denial. It's easy to not want to face it the same way as you don't want people to give you negative feedback. But actually, the realization of a need to change, as stressful as it may be, is itself this intuitive gift that you've been given to, you know, say, you know, you're doing business now. Things are going relatively okay. But it looks like you're going to need to change. Or maybe things aren't going very well, but you think it's time for us to change. You know, a lot of people might be stubborn enough to not even realize or have the intuition to even think that. So be grateful that you have had the inkling that you might need to change. Double down on that. Explore it. Don't be in denial. Face it and embrace just the possibility that you're going to need to cut something off. If it's a store, that you need to close that has never been profitable, but it was sort of like a vanity store. Like we really wanted this store because it was super cool. Or, you know, you didn't even think it was going to be super cool. You just thought it was really going to be profitable and it's not been, but you're just holding out. The decision might be on the table to get rid of that store. But I'll tell you that that's not defeat. That's facing reality. And it is giving you the chance to change. And to have the ability to do what needs to be done is a blessing, in my opinion, as hard as it's going to be. No one's arguing that it wouldn't be difficult, but you don't get anywhere from running away from reality. Now, on the opposite side of things, it could be true the other way. You might know that the right thing to do is to expand your business to a second location. And that's the only way that you're going to be able to afford to, you know, pay your staff more and you know, to expand your wholesale offerings and just be able to grow as a business. Like this is the logical next step, but you don't want to go through what you went through with store one 
and you just want to deny that this is the only way. So maybe if you just tweak things in the first store, you can make it more profitable and avoid having to do, go through the build out and go through all this stuff, right? You can apply that to anything. If you know the right move to make and you know it's going to be good, but it's going to you're going to incur a lot of stress to do it, you might equally avoid that. You could try to avoid something that you're taking away. The key here is to face it and embrace what's necessary and have faith that, especially if you're doing the kind of things what we're talking about in this episode, you're going to be able to get through it. Another aspect of iterating your business as you go is to be preemptive in your exploration uh, and make pre- being preemptive kind of a pillar of your business. So forecasting, in other words, like down the line, we might need to do X. So you're not surprised by the idea that, you know, what if we have to close this store could be a thought that you have had before the need to close the store arises. And it makes it easier for you maybe even to have, uh, you might have a contingency plan or some kind of a, a system like, okay, if that happens, then X, Y, Z, right? Being preemptive in forecasting the what ifs is a great way to take out being reactionary so that you can create more space for clarity when the time comes for change, which it there's always going to be change. How you face it in part is going to be determined by what you forecasted for and what you prepared as a result of that. And now finally, we talked about reinforcing as number five was iterate and reinforce. When I say reinforce, there might be things that are changing in your business But that doesn't mean that your values have to change. You can have the same values at a stand as you have in a 2,000 square foot brick and mortar. You can hold the means to an end with open hands and say, what are our values? Are we still living our values in the purpose for which we started this business? If the answer is yes, but the tools and the means are changing, That's not a threat to your existence because your existence is based on more than just the type of building you're in. And it's based on more than just your branding and and other maybe superficial things that become so precious to us that aren't really at the heart of what it means to be this thing, this business, your business. So as change happens, which it will, You have to build on and strengthen your roots as you go. Seasons happen. The leaves grow, they change, they fall. It happens. The roots, if they're healthy, will hold you in place. Your values are your roots. And those can be reinforced very well, even if all things are changing around you. So those are the five things that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, I'm sure we could do like an episode on each of them, you know, for you one of them might be supremely relevant. And I hope that you take time to meditate on that, think about it, discuss it with somebody and apply whatever it is you need to apply to your reality. Um, If you have any questions about this or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, of course, you can email me. Chris at keys to the shop dot com is my email. You can also use that to reach me if you're interested in working with Keys to the Shop Consulting. Chris at keys to the shop Dot com. And now as you uh, listen to this, I will be in Anaheim, California at Coffee Fest. And I'm very, very excited. Of course, Coffee Fest, as you've been hearing me talk about, I mean, this is a fantastic event. If you want to thrive as a coffee retail professional and you want to get insights from trainings, workshops, lectures, um, just the community of coffee, Coffee Fest has been doing this for 25 years, over 25 years. And what they've achieved is giving the industry probably the most effective event for coffee shop pros out there um you know listening to this right now you it's too late to go to anaheim (laughs) but but there is an opportunity to go to portland oregon in november and uh, you should definitely check that out Um, go to the website coffeefest.com find out more information about what coffee fest is all about what's going on in portland and I hope to see you there. Again, to find out more information and register to attend today, go to coffeefest.com. 
And with that, that is the end of our episode. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join me today. And I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>